Hi, welcome to the Nurture Nature Show. I am the Reverend Dr. Laura Kim Joyner of One Earth Conservation and Ministry. I serve as wildlife veterinarian and Unitarian Universalist minister. During our time together, we will have a chance to nurture ourselves so that we can nurture all of nature. Welcome into this community of hope and nourishment and solidarity with all of life. to today's Nurture Nature, where we have a chance to be nourished by the beauty within so that we can nourish all of nature. Last time I spoke about reverence for life, how we can get it and how we can be nourished by it. This week we're talking about living with reverence, a continuation of the same theme. Now, if you're watching this on recording, you can pause and have reflection or journal or talk with others in the middle of this show. Otherwise, wait for the end of the show and the reflection questions will be there for you. Let us begin today with these words from Albert Schweitzer. The human spirit is not dead. It lives on in secret. It has come to believe that compassion, in which all ethics must take root, can only attain its full breath and it embraces all living creatures and does not limit itself to humankind. So we gather today to bring out this secret and deep and vital essence of human compassion and proclaim that spirit is not dead, but lives on in the breadth and depth of all life. Let us begin our reflection today on living with reverence by imagining this scenario. Imagine a long, dusty road, and on one side of the road walks a mother, and as she is holding the hand of her daughter as they walk along. Now on the other side is also another family, a mother and a daughter, and this time instead of human, it is a chimpanzee family, and the mother is holding the hand of her daughter as they walk along. And she turns behind her and holds the hand of her mother. And her mother holds the hand of her mother, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, and so on back, each daughter holding the hand of the mother that came before them. This is also going on on the human side. The mother holding the hand of her mother, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, all the way back. And so on this long road, going back hundreds of years, thousands of years, these lines go on and on, until at one point something really special happens. The two lines begin to converge, and they get closer and closer together until there's no longer a line of separation. And actually at one point, the hand of the chimpanzee line is holding the hand of the same ancient grandmother that the human side is holding. They both share the same ancient grandmother. Now, there's just something so beautiful about thinking about these two lines converging, because it means that all those who come after us and all those who come before us, we're related to, that they have beauty, that they have inherent worth and dignity, and that they matter and they're in our circle of compassion and care. To not take the hand of those who come after us or those that came before us means that we become isolated and lonely and say these people are not in our compassion and care. But look, we're primates. We only have two hands. If we're related to everybody, how do we reach out with only two hands to take the hands of the many? It is truly hard to do that. So what we often do instead, we just drop our hands, being tired or frustrated or confused or pained. And instead, we take our hands to draw a line of separation. 
And on one side of these line is those who have beauty and worth and dignity, and on the other side are those who do not. On one side is who we care for, the other not. The line separates those who will live from those who will die. Now where to draw this line of separation between those with worth and not with worth has been part of the discussion and a lively argument for hundreds of years in the realm of moral concern. And it has captivated the imagination of philosophers and ethicists, and it divides many humans in the animal well-being movement, of which I myself am deeply embedded. One area in which I work for the benefit of all beings is something called the First Principle Project. Sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Association, it's where we ask one another, how might our lives be better if we did not draw lines of separation between other species and ourselves of who had worth and who didn't? To spark this discussion, we're specifically thinking about changing the first principle in Unitarian Universalism from the inherent worth and dignity of every person to the inherent worth and dignity of every being. Now, the goal is not to diminish the flourishing of humankind, especially those marginalized and oppressed groups. Instead, the goal is to reach out and lift up the many other species and take their hands, their paws, their flippers, their wings, their fins, their pseudopods, and lift them higher up into human awareness and compassion. Now it's really interesting where people will draw the line because it gets tricky. I mean after the ancestral grandmother we, we, we kind of get that. But how far back do we go? Do we go back to all apes? Do we go back to vertebrates, invertebrates, to the first cells in the ancient seas? There's quite a lot of diversity out there where people draw the line. So let me invite you into a time of reflection about where do you draw the line between who has worth and who does not. For instance, do you agree that all humans have inherent worth and dignity? Murderers, terrorists, rapists? Would you say that all great apes have inherent worth and dignity. Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Australopithecus. Have you drawn your line yet? How about other highly intelligent social animals such as dolphins and whales, dogs and wolves? How about cats? Now let's add all the species of vertebrates. Maybe you draw a line somewhere in here. How about the social and smart birds, crows and parrots, and other birds? Reptiles, amphibians, fish? Now how about trees and plants? Albert Schweitzer himself, who was the author of the Reverence for Life Ethic, he transplanted trees instead of killing them whenever he had a construction project to do. Okay. Perhaps you draw the line at rivers, mountains, and lakes. Yes, here too, Albert Schweitzer saw reverence. He wrote of caring for ice crystals and said, respect the order that is, and do not e interfere any more than you have to. This stuff makes for some pretty lively arguments, don't you think? For we bring into it a very deep love and care for all of life life and others. There's a lot on the line and there's an urgent sense that we get it right. Because billions of animals are suffering every day, used in production, in situations that benefit humans but not the other species. And we're losing our biodiversity and our wildlife. We are staring not only at their death but ours. The task to focus and to change who we are can be overwhelming. How can we have compassion for the many when our biology and our evolution and our culture keep 
turning us and pulling us away from the beauty and the worth of others. How indeed. Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker says this, here's our task. Our task given to us here and now is to do what we can to advance reverence for life and deepen the promise of love. She's saying that's what we are here for each other. We are to be guides to help others live with reverence for life. How do we guide others in reverence? With our very lives, with the way we live. By discussions and arguments alone, we will not reach the promised land. Albert Schweitzer, he promoted not arguments, but life. He said, my life is my argument. How is that true? How can living be an argument? In Albert Schweitzer's case, it was because he lived with beauty. He wrote and played organ music. He was an author, theologian, philosopher. He was a doctor. And he went and dedicated his life to the distressed communities of Africa. And he built a clinic. And there did he not only take care of humans, but he took care of all the animals that were brought to him. Indeed, he had a multi-species clinic. What if, like him, we used our lives not to draw lines of separation, but to bow down before the beauty and grandeur of life? Could we use reverence as a means of leading a prayerful life? The starting line for an ethical and compassionate life? Some say maybe reverence for life or Albert Schweitzer is not the way to go. That having reverence for everything results in a watered down clinic uh, ethic. For instance, for rocks, as well as for chimpanzees, they say that there's a risk that we, sleep, we slip into relativism and treat everything the same and don't use our yardsticks of amount of suffering, how much we need to use a certain resource, or our own common sense and our science. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can use all of that and still have reverence. We also might slip into another error where we dilute reverence, or we use reverence as permission giving to do whatever we want. For instance, well, I have reverence for that child. I'm going to kill that child now anyway. One example that I often hear is people refer to the indigenous people, such as when they're out hunting a deer. And they say a prayer before they kill the deer. They have reverence. Now, here's the thing. That's a really good starting point, but reverence is not a rote prayer. It can't be dismissed lightly. Reverence takes study, attention, and risk. It means taking time to know the science, the biology, the evolution, the thinking and feelings. What's going on with that deer? What do they need? How does life want to come through the deer? It means holding in one's heart that your direct actions can cause the suffering and pain to another. So when we're doing reverence for life, it isn't eat, love, and pray. It's pray, love, and then eat only if you have to. Now making that distinction is difficult. We all harm to survive. How do we diminish that's harm? And that's why when we engage in reverence for life, it's a community affair. We can't do it alone. We need support to take the risk and to handle these difficult questions. It's a new territory we're journeying into, this paradigm of multi-species compassion. But I think we can do it. It's like when our first great ape ancestors went out from the jungles onto the savannas. It was a new journey for them, too, and they needed each other to survive the rigors and the dangers. They're not always sure they liked one another, but they depended on one another. And so the challenge, too, for us is to get along. But we have 
millennia, millions of years of training our emotional capacity for compassion for ourselves and for others. Reference calls us to all be grand empathizers and not judge another human or another animal for being part of the circle of life because all of us make tragic decisions to benefit our own lives. The predator and prey cycle is alive, and so is collaboration. Though I myself eat mostly a plant-based diet, I know that driving my car, my international trips, they add to climate change. And the soy products that I eat, the tofu, can cause devastating impacts on environments, biodiversity, and the people who inhabit these lands. Reverence means we must be present to this interconnected web of beauty and harm and benefit and love. It is a crucible. And in this awareness, I believe comes a chance to be more compassionate and more whole. The dance of reverence is like a two-step. It's life and death and life, always walking in between and with all of life so that we can have compassionate responses and sing to the melody of the existence of which we are part. The song is not easy to hear, but it's life-giving regardless. Each responds to the song of life differently. And one way that I respond by trying to live as ethically and compassionately and connected as I can is to be a wildlife veterinarian in Latin America. I see my work as a spiritual endeavor. I have to be able to witness the tragedy I see in the senseless suffering of the people and parrots of Latin America. So I must be open to beauty as much as I can. At one time during the guerrilla warfare years in Guatemala, when I lived there as a country in Central America in the 1990s, it became too much for me to see the violence and the suffering. I closed off to life. And I had to leave conservation for over a decade. I caught better with reverence leading the way so I can be present to the beauty and the tragedy and now work in several countries. Reverence still calls me mighty, mightily to task. It's not over. All the time I'm faced with trying to hold the beauty and the tragedy and the worth of all and everybody, such as a story that happened last year in Honduras. I came right up to that wall that was hard to pass, that impenetrable wall of harsh reality where I just wanted to run away. Once again, I saw that most of the wild parrots that are being poached, stolen, torn from their families illegally were suffering. And once in captivity, they are treated so harshly out of ignorance and they suffer and they live very short lives. The people, too, lead lives of desperation, seeking a better way, while in the throes of income equality, drug violence, corruption, and in the highest homicide rate in the world. But the Mosquito indigenous people with whom I work are making a stand, reclaiming their lands and fighting against the illegal wildlife trade. But not all of them. One man defied the laws of his country and the collective decision of his village. And he continued to steal, to steal the baby parrots from their wild nests. One day, he climbed a tall pine tree to take the two wild scarlet chicks from the nest. While he was at the top of the tree, he made a mistake and he fell. He died at the base of the tree, and so did one of the two scarlet chicks that he landed on. The other survived. A cross and gravestone marks the base of the tree. 
and I went to go visit this one day with the villagers. As we drove up, the cars emptied out, and the people rushed towards the tree, and they began to cry and kneel and chant and pray. Though this man had gone against their wishes, was taking the biodiversity from them, he was still beloved and honored. I, I was moved. And so I too began to sing a Zuni Pueblo prayer that I sing every day at home. And I sang, I add my breath to your breath that our days may be long on this earth that the days of all beings may be long. I looked at the base of this tree and all I saw was death. But if I craned my neck up to the top of the tree, I saw a beautiful giant of a tree with parrots to come in the future with their children staying together, flying free and beautiful. And then when I looked back down at the base of the tree, I saw the peoples, this man's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, playing and laughing and living in healthy relationship with the parrots that fly over them. He and his kind are responsible for much pain in my life and the lives of many. But let fear and pain not deter us from love. Out of awareness of death and loss comes life and love and family arises. We can't choose who is in our family or who is in the family of life, but we can decide how we share our lives with them. By calling all into the family, we live a life of reverence. It's not easy to do, but the way through it, I believe, is not through shame or guilt or arguments. The way through it is with joyful, compassionate action. What that exactly looks like, no one's really clear. How do we stop the poaching and improve the lives of these people? How do we reverse climate change or mend a broken relationship? We're not clear. But nonetheless, Albert Schweitzer invites us to go forward by becoming a sibling to all who live and die and open up, not just our hands, but our arms to welcome everybody into the circle of compassion. And I believe in that relationship of reverence. I'm pretty clear we can be healed. I have been. And we can bring our principles to life. And we can do this as we remember these words from the Sufi poet Rumi. Your hand opens and closes, opens and closes. If it was always a fist, or always open, we would be paralyzed. But our deepest presence comes from the expanding and the contracting, the opening and the closing. Our hands as coordinated and balanced as two birds' wings. Let us now take a moment of reflection with these words adapted from Alicia Carpenter, just as long as I have breath. As long as we have breath, let us answer yes to life. Though with pain we make our way, let us hope meet us each day. If they ask what we did well, tell them we said yes to life, to all of life. As long as our vision lasts, we must answer yes to truth. In our dreams of the dark, that elusive spark, the light of life, the reverence that we know as worth and dignity, let it shine before us. And if they ask us what we did well, tell them that we said yes to truth. As long as our heart beats, we must answer yes to love. Disappointment pierced us through 
we kept on loving you, spirit of life, child of life, sibling, great ape, friend, octopus. If they ask what we did best, let us tell them that we said yes to love. And now let us go from one another with these words adapted from Albert Schweitzer. We leave here now friends of all, inwardly united with everything, the secret of life's beautiful interconnection brightly illuminated with the light of our shared time together. And so now our time has ended, but our service to the world has just begun. Go in peace and love and reverence.